Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's good to be with you, as always. Apparently, there's a movie going on at some point that my sons are pretty excited about. <clears throat> uh, so this morning, I am bringing a message to you about Jesus and his teachings on the Sabbath. So Jesus and his teachings on the Sabbath. Um, and talking about three stories that we have from three parts of Luke, where he, he heals and um, talks to different people about the Sabbath in connection to that. So these three stories, one of them is when the disciples are walking along on the Sabbath and picking grain while they walk. And if you've ever picked a head of grain when it's ripe and you rub it, between your hands just like this. I did this one time in Israel, and I'm proud of doing this. So you, you rub that head of grain, and it actually kind of takes off the husk and things so that the, the grain itself is separated, and then you can eat it. You can just bypass that whole grinding and bread-making process and eat, eat the grain that way. So that's what they were doing. Um, and that was not looked on well. Number two story, it, right after that, is Jesus publicly healing a man's shriveled hand on the Sabbath. And the third one is Jesus publicly healing a woman who is bent over by a spirit. <clears throat> uh, she's been bent over like this for 18 years, and Jesus heals her. So these are three stories in Luke. There are more Sabbath <clears throat> stories in, in the other Gospels, but in Luke that we have. So I am going to launch in and read these stories. So it's a, a bit of a chunk of scripture, bear with me, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about Sabbath and uh, what is the Sabbath? What does it mean for us today? Who is the king? How does the, you know, we're talking in this whole series about the kingdom of God. How does the Sabbath factor into the kingdom of God? And uh, what is the king like? You know, that has created the Sabbath and that is teaching the people about Sabbath um, here in, in Luke. All right, so starting in Luke 6, 1 to 11. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did? when he and his companions were hungry. He entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. I'm sure that set them back a notch. Uh, so story two comes right after that. One, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on another Sabbath, he, Jesus, went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Okay, that was the second one. So one more story, Luke 13, 10 to 17. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, 
the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to be the water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. What interesting stories. In each of these cases, you have Pharisees or the teachers of the law or synagogue leaders, the local leadership that people really respected in their communities. They were protesting Jesus's you know, clearly reckless attitude toward the Sabbath. What is going on with this guy? You know, they're, they're watching him closely. <clears throat> the, the words, the description of them, like, is that guy, is that guy? we've got to keep an eye on him. Um, so they are, they are very concerned about this reckless attitude toward the Sabbath. In each case, Jesus answers their concerns. He doesn't ignore them. He tries to help them to see a better way of understanding. He dialogues with them. He's concerned about these, uh, these individuals as well. He's concerned about the leaders. He's, of course, very concerned about the people he's healing and what the mass of people who are all just watching are, are paying attention to. And very interesting is looking at the responses. In each case, the response is really mixed. You have some people being delighted. It specifically says the people are, you know, delighted. And surely the people who experience these healings are so delighted to be free from what they've been suffering. Um, some are humiliated. Jesus, his words humiliate them. That's uncomfortable. That Jesus could be humiliating people with his words. And some are furious. Okay, so some, some react with great anger and perhaps even murderous. You, you see them starting to plan, what can we do to get rid of this guy? So, reflecting on these, these three Sabbath uh, passages here in Luke, um, I have some initial questions that I, as I was looking at the passage, I, I thought, it's hard to not start thinking, what is the Sabbath? What is the Sabbath? Why do we have a Sabbath? Why don't Christians celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday? As the Israelites and the Jews did, as Jesus did. So that's, that's another question. Why do we celebrate it on Sunday as Christians? How much should our Sabbath correspond to the biblical practice? Should we be practicing Sabbath at all? Is Jesus saying here that it's okay to mow our lawns on Sunday? <clears throat> I like to remind you that I usually teach for three hours straight, and so I'm much more comfortable if that's the time frame we're working with, so I'm assuming everyone's okay with that. <clears throat> These are a lot of good questions, right? And we cannot answer most of them and still get home for lunch. Um, but these are questions that often pop into our heads when we think about Sabbath and when we read anything about the Sabbath in Scripture. What should we do about Sabbath? Um, I started a Ph.D. program um, at a, an, an Old Testament at a school called Andrews University, which is Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know if you're familiar with Seventh-day Adventist, um, but they are, I had wonderful experience there, wonderful people but they have pretty firm answers about what to do about Sabbath, which you can see in their name. Uh, they say that we as Christians should be observing Sabbath. It's one of the 10 commandments after all, you know, it's one of the 10, how are we possibly ignoring one of them broadly as a church? We should also be observing it on Saturday, which is a, a different perspective. And we should definitely not be working on that day. So there's a perspective to interact with. Um, I'm going to share a couple different uh, quotes and, and stories and thoughts on Sabbath, and then we'll come back to the passage. Because I know that all of you have a, probably a very interesting variety of experience from your lifetime of how you grew up 
uh, doing Sabbath in your families and what was required or if maybe not much was required, what you were allowed to do or what you were not allowed to do. Um, so to start, I'm a real big fan of Mark Twain's um, a little less known work, Extracts from Adam's Diary. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it is very funny. It's a, he wrote a diary from Adam's perspective as in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and uh, a lot of complaining, um, especially a lot of complaining about this other creature who had been created. Um, anyway, one of the funny things about that diary is that every time he gets to Sunday, which Mark Twain is, he, that's the Sabbath he's working with, uh, most of the entries are two words, hold through hold through. <laughs> so, but the first, the first one, um, the first entry on Sunday is a little longer. I'm going to read it to you. Sunday, hold through. This day is getting to be more and more trying. I was selected and set apart. It, it was selected and set apart last November as a day of rest. I had already six of them per week before. This morning, I found that new creature Eve, trying to clod apples out of the forbidden tree, period. So, uh, so his perspective of, of Adam throughout this diary is that Sunday was pretty rough to get through. He didn't enjoy Sabbath. It was kind of a pain for him. Um, I have a, a quote from a Civil War era preacher, um, Henry Ward Beecher. He's the, he's the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, and he was, became a very well-known preacher uh, during his lifetime. He writes, a world without a Sabbath would be like a man without a smile, like a summer without flowers, and like a homestead without a garden. It is the most joyous day of the week. So there's a completely different perspective for you. I'm curious what the experience was like for you. I'm going to read you one more um, perspective outside of my own, which is Laura Ingalls Wilder. You're familiar with probably Little House in the Prairie, and she wrote a whole series, and this is from Little House in the Big Woods. I couldn't resist reading this, this Sabbath story <clears throat> to you. So the context of this story is that uh, Laura is really grumpy about having to do Sabbath. You know, she, she just wants to play and be loud and running around. And she finally comes out with, I hate Sunday. And um, her father calls her over and he says, I'm going to tell you a story about when grandpa was a boy. The subtext there is you think you have it bad. Um, so <laughs> this is the story of grandpa's sled and the pig. If you've never heard this, you're in for a little treat. I might zip through some parts of it, but... Okay, when your grandpa was a boy, Laura, Sunday did not begin on Sunday morning as it does now. It began at sundown on Saturday night. Then everyone stopped every kind of work or play. Supper was solemn. After supper, grandpa's father read aloud a chapter of the Bible while everyone sat straight and still in his chair. Then they all knelt down and their father said a long prayer. When he said amen, they got up from their knees and each took a candle and went to bed. They must go straight to bed with no playing, laughing, or even talking. Sunday morning, they ate a cold breakfast because nothing could be cooked on Sunday. Then they all dressed in their best clothes and walked to church. They walked because hitching up the horses was work and no work could be done on Sunday. They must walk slowly and solemnly looking straight ahead. They must not joke or laugh or even smile. Grandpa and his two brothers walked ahead and their father and mother walked behind them. In church, Grandpa and his brothers must sit perfectly still for two long hours and listen to the sermon. See, two, two's not as long as I'm going to be. I was thinking about They dared not fidget on the hard bench. They dared not swing their feet. They dared not turn their heads to look at the windows or the walls or the ceiling of the church. They must sit perfectly motionless, and never for one instant take their eyes from the preacher. By the way, this is also what we do in our home. I, I don't know if you, this is a lot like our, yeah. 
When church was over, they walked slowly home. They might talk on the way, but they must not talk loudly, and they must never laugh or smile. At home, they ate a cold dinner, which had been cooked the day before. Then, all the long afternoon, they must sit in a row on a bench and study their catechism. Until at last, the sun went down and Sunday was over. Okay, now that's the introduction to the story. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit. They, they were building a sled in this particular week. They tried to get it finished. They tried to get it finished in time so that they would be able to use their sled before, like on Saturday, before Sunday came. But they didn't quite manage it. So uh, instead of being able to use this wonderful sled they'd been working on, um, they, they launched right into Sunday. And this is in, in their efforts to still be able to go sledding on Sunday. This is what the story is. Okay, so one week, Grandpa and his two brothers, James and George, were making a new sled. They worked at it every minute of their playtime. It was the best sled they had ever made, and it was so long that all three of them could sit on it, one behind the other. They planned to finish it in time to slide downhill Saturday afternoon, for every Saturday afternoon they had two or three hours to play, but their father ended up keeping them working so they couldn't do it. After the sun went down, they could not slide downhill, not even once. That would be breaking the Sabbath. So they put the sled in the shed behind the house to wait until Sunday was over. All the two long hours in church next day, while they kept their feet still and their eyes on the preacher, they were thinking about the sled. At home, while they ate dinner, they couldn't think of anything else. After dinner, their father sat down to read the Bible, and Grandpa and James and George sat as still as mice on their bench with their catechism. But they were thinking about the sled. The sun shone brightly, and the snow was smooth and glittering on the road. They could see it through the window. It was a perfect day for sliding downhill. They looked at their catechism, and they thought about the new sled, and it seemed that Sunday would never end. After a long time, they heard a snore. They looked at their father, and they saw that his head had fallen against the back of his chair, and he was fast asleep. Then James looked at George, and James got up from the bench and tiptoed out of the room through the back door. George looked at Grandpa, and George tiptoed after James. And Grandpa looked fearfully at their father. This is a story about the Grandpa. But on tiptoe, he followed George and left their father snoring. They took their new sled and went quietly up to the top of the hill. They meant to slide down just once. Then they would put the sled away and slip back to their bench and the catechism before their father woke up. James sat in front on the sled, then George, and then Grandpa, because he was the littlest. The sled started at first slowly, then faster and faster. It was running, flying down this long, steep hill. But the boys dared not shout. They must slide silently past the house without waking their father. There was no sound except the little whir of the runners on the snow and the wind rushing past. Then, just as the sled was swooping toward the house, a big black pig stepped out of the woods. He walked into the middle of the road and stood there. The sled was going so fast it couldn't be stopped. There wasn't time to turn it. The sled went right under the hog and picked him up. <laughs> With a squeal, he sat down on James. And he kept on squealing long and loud and shrill. Squee! Squee! They flashed by the house, the pig sitting in front, then James, then George, then Grandpa. And they saw their father standing in the doorway, looking at them. They couldn't stop. They couldn't hide. There was no time to say anything. Down the hill they went, the hog sitting on James and squealing all the way. At the bottom of the hill they stopped. The hog jumped off and James of James and ran away into the woods, still squealing. There's a, there's a great picture. I wish you could, could see it here. The boys walked slowly and solemnly up the hill. They put the sled away. They sneaked into the house and slipped quietly to their places on the bench. Their father was reading his Bible. He looked up at them without saying a word. Then he went on reading, and they studied their catechism. But when the sun went down and the Sabbath day was over, their father took them out to the woodshed and tanned their jackets. First James, then George, then Grandpa. So you see, Laura and Mary, Pa said, you may find it hard to be good, but you should be glad that it isn't as hard to be good now as it was when Grandpa was a boy. <laughs>
<laughs> so I could believe that some of you had experienced Sabbath growing up a little more like that. Um, I just want to finally share with you a bit about what Sabbath was like for me uh, when I was living in Israel and for Phil. Um, it's similar experiences. Um, so when I was living in Israel, in Jerusalem in particular, where many, many people still celebrate the Sabbath, um, the streets are empty, the buses stop running, the whole city becomes quiet. There is a wonderful feeling of communal rest. And let me back up and say uh, that the weekend in Israel is Friday and Saturday. So it's interesting. And Sunday, everyone is back to the, to the work week. So that's the first day of the work week in Israel. <clears throat> so on Thursday nights, uh, which are like our Friday nights then, when I was studying in Jerusalem, I used to go dancing with friends, I'd go out dancing. This is a long time ago. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> then I'd wake up the next morning and take the bus down to the Machne Yehuda market, an open street market that had all kinds of vendors and um, all kinds of fresh produce and breads and things. And I would buy my groceries for the week, fruit and bread and olives. And the pita would be so hot from the oven that it burned my back in my backpack uh, while I was carrying it. And often I would catch one of the last buses running before they stopped entirely in the early afternoon to get back to my apartment building. We lived in these high-rise dorm apartments. Um, <clears throat> and then loud horns across the city literally announced the start of Sabbath. It'd be like, this long, loud horn. Everybody knew, okay, Sabbath has started. And as it started to get dark, you know, families gathered together our friends would gather together for a meal in someone's apartment. Often, uh, Phil and I would both be there. And we would often say the traditional Jewish prayers and liturgy, uh, just as part of being in the culture there, to start the Sabbath and bless the bread and the wine. Someone would have brought a loaf or two of challah, which is the traditional braided bread um, that you might have seen or, or tasted before, a little sweet. Um, and we would, we would break the bread into pieces and dip it in salt. Very traditional. I tell you this story about Sabbath in Israel to help you think, uh, and these other ones as well, outside of your own experiences of Sunday Sabbath. We have our own experiences and our own preloaded thoughts of what Sabbath is uh, coming from our, our life experiences. <clears throat> and it's hard not to bring those to the text. And it's not, it's not that that's a terrible thing to do, um, but I want you to consider, um, to kind of invite you to think about how very different the practice of Sabbath was in Jesus' time than what we've experienced as 20th, 21st century Christians. Also, sometimes I think when God designed the Sabbath, he did forget about three-year-olds and their parents. Um, Sabbath observance has a very long history. You know, it's a very, very long history, and it has been shifts as it's moved through into the church and, and how we have moved it into Sunday. Um, and as you look across Scripture, if you just do a word study on Sabbath, you, you see a long trajectory there, too. It's very interesting. And you have the start of it, really, in creation, and God resting on that seventh day. That's the first hint toward the Sabbath. So I just thought, you know, for us to really think about what Jesus was doing in these passages, it would be helpful um, to think about what the original intent was, the best we can understand. Um, so I'm going to drag us back to, yes, the Ten Commandments for a moment. And uh, the fifth commandment is the Sabbath law. So in Exodus 28, I'm just going to read it for us. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days a week are set apart for your daily duties and regular work. But the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any kind of work. This includes you, your sons and daughter, <clears throat> daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. <clears throat> 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, and then he rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. In Deuteronomy, you have the Ten Commandments restated, and uh, there is also included there the statement, Remember, you were once slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out with amazing power and mighty deeds. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. Fast forward to John 9, 16. Some of the Pharisees said, This man, Jesus, is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Was Jesus really not keeping the Sabbath? As, as, you know, you see him, I, I looked all across the Gospels at Jesus and the Sabbath, and he is most certainly keeping the Sabbath, but he is doing some things that they are very uncomfortable with, for sure. Um, notice in that law, in that commandment, there wasn't a, a notation to not play or laugh. Uh, there did, what wasn't mentioned to not heal wasn't a specific mention of um, not grabbing a bite to eat when you're walking by a grain field. Um, so it's interesting that Jesus didn't say directly to the people, like, you've added a bunch of stuff to this law that's not ever been intended. Um, but he speaks to them kindly, I think, and tries to help them to understand it in different various ways. Um, so just a, a statement about what I, what I see the original purpose was of the Sabbath law. One, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear as you look across that God intended to give a space of time for rest for all of Israel. That was regular, frequent, and long. 24 hours, that's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's hard to do Sabbath. Uh, Mark Twain is right about that in some, in some regards. <laughs> it's hard to really take this kind of a full day break and let go that entirely of your work. And this was something he wanted for all parts of Israel society. The foreigners are included. Slaves that were living in their communities were included. Um, animals are included. The land is even included in some regards. That the land have its Sabbaths was uh, a, a piece that's referred to frequently in the prophets. Mark 2.27 includes Jesus' words in one of these very similar passages that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So, to give this, this time of rest for God's people. That's one of the purposes. Number two, to remember or to think on the creator and God's work of creation, after which he also rested. Very interesting about this law is that God is asking them to imitate him. Imitate me in this process of resting on the seventh day every week. I did this. Surely you can, you know. <laughs> So, to re and remembering that God, that God's own work of creation, that all the beauty around us uh, here in central Pennsylvania, I think we are to be reminded that this beauty is the hand of God. He is our creator. And that Sabbath, this weekly regular time that God set aside for his people, part of that was for them to remember that, to connect him to the reality of being the creator of heaven and earth. Number three, for Israel to remember God's act of salvation in the Exodus. The Exodus is the gospel salvation story of the Old Testament that they looked back to and remembered that God saved them out of slavery, set them free from captivity. And he reminds them that they should give rest to those working for them because they were not given that. So the slaves in their household, it specified they must give them rest, remembering that they didn't receive that and it was terrible for them in Egypt. So to remember God's act of salvation is another purpose when God established the Sabbath. I have two more. Bear with me here. So number four, this is kind of by inference, to teach Israel that they should be separate and distinct from the world around them, 
Other societies around them didn't even necessarily have a seven-day week. They didn't have a day of rest every seven days. We're used to this concept very much. It's been ingrained into our culture, but it was a new thing when it was established, and it made them look separate. And we're, you know, we're sitting here in church because God mandated the Sabbath. And as it went through down through history, it came to mean, you know, for Christians, Sunday and attending worship services on Sunday. So the Sabbath, uh, Sabbath law certainly lives on in how we have applied it in the church. And it does make us distinct. If you say, well, I go to church on Sunday, it, it does mark you off as, as being a Christian. And it was to do that for Israel. It was to show that they were a different people and reflected something about them, marked them as part of, um, part of the people of, of the God, Yahweh. And also, it kind of required that they ultimately trust God for survival and flourishing, not the work of their own hands, because that's a whole day of work they could have done uh, to ensure that they would have enough food over the winter, you know, a little, a little more time a working could have been very helpful. Um, so God was asking them to trust him that he would care for them instead. So in summary, the Sabbath was to remind them of their relationship with God who saved them and gave them rest and to uh, help them to remember and trust in him. Now, a few, a few insights about the king, the king of this kingdom of God, looking at the Sabbath, and then looking at, you know, Jesus as he interacts with the Sabbath. God wants his people to remember the good things he has done for them, how he has rescued them. God wants me to remember the good things he's done for me and how he has rescued me. That's something he wants me to regularly think on, at least once a week. <laughs> and God wants you to remember the good things that he's done for you and how he's rescued you. God wants his people to be distinct from the world around them, to be separate in their behavior in a way that marks them as God's people. <clears throat> This is always a hard one. How much are we separate? How much do we be different from the world around us? How much do we also, like Jesus, go into that world and, and shed light on it, but still be distinct? And I would add that these distinctions are to be winsome. God requiring his people to stop working and rest every seven days as an example of what he is requiring of his people, is not burdensome and unattractive. It's a nice thing to be able to stop like that and rest. <clears throat> how are we distinct? How should we be distinct? And how should we also engage? Something to think about here. Uh, also, God wants to give his people regular times of rest from their work. He wants to give his people rest. Sometimes I think I can uh, and we can maybe focus on God, uh, that the passage is like Jesus saying, um, you must pick up your cross and follow me. And recognizing, you know, the life of a Christian is going to be hard and full of trials. Um, and we forget that he also says, what? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So we have God in, in the form of Jesus also calling us to rest. The gift of rest. Have you come into rest? Are you able to do that? Are you able to, to give yourself rest and feel that this is God's gift and not me being lazy? Am I, you know, we can, certainly central Pennsylvania errs in one direction or the other, and it's not the lazy one, right? We're, <laughs> you know, a hardworking, uh, hardworking crew around here. <clears throat> 
So if anything, I would challenge you uh, to try to enjoy God's rest, the king wanting you to have these regular times of rest. Another insight, God wants his people to trust him ultimately and not their own ability to earn a bit more by working in all of their margins. I'm a good rester. I like to rest. I'm, I'm, fond, of <laughs> I'm fond of resting. Um, but when things get busy, I, you know, you fill up all your margins and then you kind of sleep when you can. <clears throat> This is also, you know, God's desire to give his people rest is where the three-year-old question comes in in my mind. Like, do you remember that uh, you created three-year-olds and how they would be and the rest component maybe not being very possible? Conversation I've had with God. Uh, But yes, trusting God that he will be enough when we are not enough. And God wants his people to remember that he is the creator. Uh, A weekly thought in that direction um, seems to be imbued in in the Sabbath. So, okay, so thinking about these teachings about the Sabbath that I think were originally there, and going back to what is going on with Jesus, um, when he is healing people and making making others very angry for this kind of work. They say, you're working. You're breaking the Sabbath. Um, I think he has compassion for these these teachers and leaders and Pharisees because they are trying so hard to honor God by being very careful about the law. But they have twisted it. Or their ancestors have twisted it at some point. The Sabbath law got twisted. And so by the time of the New Testament era, there is something very off that Jesus is trying to breathe life back into Sabbath that's, that's been squeezed out, for sure. And Jesus is, is indicating to them, you know, these little things, you know, picking some, some grain and things like this, you're getting a little OCD about the Sabbath when you are very upset about that. And then when he is healing people and they're getting upset, I think you see more of his frustration, you know, and he's doing it very publicly. He is trying to help people understand that they are thinking wrongly about the laws in general and Sabbath in particular here. Uh, One statement that stands out to me is the synagogue leader being so kind of ticked off, right, with this healing this woman who's bent over. He he says, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. I almost find that amusing. It's like, you know, call during business hours. And Jesus is like, for heaven's sake, do you not see how wrong this is? That what you are saying here is what's valuable is the law, not the woman. And that's so very wrong. So very, very wrong. It's just a word about legalism, what I think Jesus was battling here. I think legalism is basically following the law for the law's sake, without interest in the purpose of the law or the heart or character of the lawgiver. So following the law for the law's sake, without interest in the purpose behind that or the heart or character of the lawgiver. The focus there is on the law itself. What are the various ways to avoid breaking this law? I'd like to give you an analogy of a traffic light. So, thinking of a traffic light, the law is that cars must stop at red lights. Anyone ever go through a red light? I'm pretty pretty bad on this one myself. I'm not the best law abider. I mean, not when it's, you know, okay. Anyway, legalistic thinking would suggest with a red light, maybe we should stop at the yellow, you know, because going from yellow to red happens quite suddenly. You know, all of us have done the pink light, probably that's, you know, it's, it was yellow. I swear it was yellow as I was going under it and then it turned red. Anyway, Phil calls those pink. That was a little pink there. 
<clears throat> so maybe, you know, legalistic thinking is we should, if it turns yellow, stop, absolutely stop. But it's not just that. It's just maybe, in fact, you know, going from green to yellow also happens pretty quickly. So maybe at a green light, we should also stop. This is kind of the thinking that was developing <laughs> with the Pharisees and uh, the, the full-blown, um, overdeveloped application of, of how the laws should work in the New Testament era. Maybe we should not drive, because if we drive, we might go through a red light. The focus there is very much not on the why of the law. The focus is wrong. Jesus is saying, you are forgetting why we have traffic lights. This is what is important. He's not really saying that. What Jesus is really saying is that you are forgetting why we have the Sabbath. Why do we have Sabbath? Not so that we can be very careful never to break Sabbath. That's not why we have Sabbath. Observing the Sabbath is a little like stopping at a red light. There is a purpose behind it. That is the value of the law. So laws or rules do not have value in and of themselves. And the New Testament era leaders of the Jewish people, particularly the Pharisees, um, had gotten lost in their focus on the law itself. I think they had really done that. They had become very focused on the laws themselves. And they had forgotten the lawgiver and his purpose in the laws, which were to be life-giving, all of them. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to breathe the life back into them that had been sucked out. And then to show that that life could live outside of the codified law altogether in the new covenant, but not outside of the lawgiver, who is the king. So, as we think about the Sabbath, I would encourage you in, in all of our rules and thinking to think about the heart of the king who stands behind those rules and that that is really, really what God wants us to think on rather than how we can best follow that, that rule. Don't get obsessed with the traffic lights, but be very concerned about the lives of the people around you that you are protecting by not going through the red light. And um, similarly with Sabbath, this is the heart of Jesus that you see. Like the Sabbath is not, you know, made here to crush you and to be a great burden. It is to be life-giving and rest. And restoration is what he's doing. He's healing people on the Sabbath and trying to help people shake out of this image of law-obsessed. So, love to hear your pig sled stories. But thank you. <laughs>